The bias band is a very neat way to finish a neckline. Here's how to accomplish it. This bias knitted band may be used either on a shaped neckline with the shaping created as you knit it on the machine or on a cut and sew neckline. We start out by casting on several stitches at one end of the bed. I've chosen the left end. I'll be decreasing on this side and increasing to the right. I've cast on and I have already knitted two rows. Simple decrease, although you could use a full fashioned one if you wanted. And simple increase on the right to knit two rows. And it's simplicity itself. We just repeat this all the way across. If we reach the right hand side and don't have enough band length, all we have to do is scrap off in a contrasting color, then move all the stitches back to the left side and do it some more. You do not have to use simple increases. It takes longer, but it makes a neater edge if you use a full-fashioned increase. However, typically what I decide to do is make the decreased edge show on the right side, the increased edge show on the inside, and that comes out fine. It's a good idea to test what your stitch count looks like when it comes off the machine on a small swatch before you do the whole neckline. The reason being that bias knitting behaves differently than regular knitting in several ways. One of them is that it quickly tends to get longer and skinnier than you thought it was going to be. The other one is that it barely rolls at all. So it's nice to be able to predict how wide your binding is going to be. And even though the pattern will probably tell you, there are two reasons you would want to be sure. One, suppose you decided to use this neck binding on a pattern that didn't call for it. That'd be fine, but nobody's going to then tell you what to expect. The other reason is that individual yarns will work up somewhat differently, even if they're the same size as each other. So across I go, creating some neckline binding, and then we will get back together. Here's our bias strip, and in case you're wondering what makes it bias, it's the diagonal nature of it. You can see this is the direction the stitches were made, but because of the increases and decreases, if I hold it with the stitches straight up, it makes quite a slant. You may have heard of yarns that tend to bias. That is something different, although it does produce the similar slant in the knitting, but it doesn't have the same effects as knitting that we purposely create to bias. The reason that a yarn may bias is that the separate pieces that make it up, called the plies, have uneven amounts of twist, or when they were plied together, I'm having trouble separating this one for you to see, but you can see the striations, each of those striations is a ply. If they are over twisted or not even, it can create a yarn that knits on the diagonal, but that is not what we're doing here. This yarn doesn't bias. Here I've succeeded in getting a little piece unwound. One of the good things about purposely bias knitting is that it has much more flexibility to go around a curve without making puckers here than straight vertically knitted knitting. And you can see this is now pinned surrounding a cut and surged edge with, as I mentioned, the increases on the inside. 
and it would make a very nice neckline. I'm showing, using the purl side as the right side in this pinning, but it can also be used with the knit side as the right side, so let's do that next. Here it is pinned around the neckline. There's the straight of it. So you can see it is the right side, the knit side of stockinette. Enclosing the neckline with the knit side out. A couple of things that I want to point out to you. First of all, I did something you would never do. Use contrasting stitching for my serging. And even so, this really, really hides it. So you would, of course, try to match it better. But that's a nice feature of this band that if you want to do cut and sew, but you really don't like seeing signs of it later, this will, will hide it. Certainly, if it was all pale aqua thread, you would never see it. But it's really hard to see now. I have to, now we can see it a little bit. Another thing before I stitch it down, to make it the neatest it can possibly be, you don't really want to divide this in half. This is exactly half, but what we really want to do is roll it slightly so that the outer edge is just a hair wider than the inner edge. That will ensure that when we stitch along here, that stitching can't be seen from the outside. So let's get it pinned like that and then stitch it on. Now I'm going to show you stitching it by hand. However, the nature of this fabric really lends itself to stitching by machine if you're comfortable doing that. What you would do in that case is open it up, stitch this side down. I would use a zigzag stitch and then fold it and stitch this side down. Or you can stitch the inside with a zigzag stitch and the outside by hand. One thing I should point out, the way we knitted this, it makes a diagonal end. You can use that or hide it. If you're making something that ties in the front, this can extend down the front. Say there's a knot up here, press this out and the diagonal finish to the tie will be nice. If you're just going around the neckline, there are ways that you could even this up by machine knitting it with a miter. But what I normally do is just knit enough extra that I can trim it off and hide this in the seam. That's probably a subject for its own video. In the meantime, let's stitch this on. Remember that when you put a neckline over a person's head, you generally want to be able to stretch the fabric. So we want to make a nice compromise between preserving stretch for that reason and getting this firmly pinned down. A nice feature of these simple increases is that they make an easy place to whip stitch into and pull almost snug, but not real tight. You can always pull backwards a little to make sure that as much stretch as is needed still remains. Even if I had not adjusted it so the outer line of stitching would cover this line of stitching, this wouldn't be very noticeable. I finished the interior stitching line. Now I'm going to release this. See what I mean? It's mighty hard to see where I've been. But now let's do the exterior line. Let me restore this pin to its position. This edge may still tend to roll a tiny bit. So you want to make sure it's unrolled to stitch through it. And of course, this being the exterior edge, neatness counts even more than it does on the inside. 
So frequent stitches into the very edge stitch. There's one thing I didn't tell you in, probably should have. I did not press this band. It will only get, in this instance, the same amount of steaming as the entire garment. But another way to use it is to kill the band with a lot of steam first. That would make it flatter and thinner, and it would also have less body. Either is an acceptable alternative. It's just depending on your yarn choice and also your style preference. Let me finish going all the way around here and then we'll look at the finished band. And here's the finished neckline. It really is a nice finish. And if for some reason I wanted to, either for style reasons, I wanted to see top stitching or because I was concerned about stability, I could treat the line of stitching you just saw me make as basting and now run a line of machine stitching along here. It would create a visible dimple. Very often you can't see the stitches, but you can see the dimple. Here it is top stitched on the sewing machine. And of course that's very, very secure. Here it is top stitched on the sewing machine. And of course that's very, very secure. My new terrific tunics book contains 10 sweater designs, one of which calls for the bias neckband. So that's why I was anxious to make sure that you had support and understood how to do it. However, several of the designs could use the bias neckband as a substitute. 